Hello, and welcome to Naval Diplomacy. Now, before we begin, begin. Voila, new starting sequence. And yeah, this is going to come out tomorrow, which is the 16th of July. And I thought I'd make a quick announcement because my dad's birthday is the 17th of July. So, Sunday will be the normal brew ships, but there'll be a little bit of a birthday party for my dad as well. Just a little one. <laughs> Included. Just because, well, I can. Yeah. And he was a naval architect, and he would have actually really enjoyed this YouTube channel. Although, then I would have had the interesting debate of my own father asking me questions online. Yes, there might be small mercies. There might be just one small mercy. I don't know. So, naval diplomacy. Had some interesting books for this. Of course, Gorshkov, Sea Power of the State. The Battle on the Breeze by Admiral the Fleet, Sir Edward Ashmore, the gentleman who was the midshipman at Singtao in 1939. And I know that's not quite how the, it's supposed to be pronounced, but in the nicest way, that's how the British spelt it in the period, so um, that's why I'm going with that one. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum of rather expensive books is this one. Royal Navy and Maritime Power, uh, edited by Ian Speller in the, is in the 20th century. Royal Navy and Maritime Power in the 20th century. Um, mainly I got this out to try and look through and see what they were talking, uh, they were going to be talking about. And they do have a whole chapter written by Ian Speller called Naval Diplomacy Operation Advantage 1961. Now, for those who do not know, Operation Advantage. Well, it's an interesting op. It's all about Kuwait and defending Kuwait. Yes, it takes place in 1961. And who are you defending Kuwait from again? Oh, yes. Iraq. And from Central Iran. And Saudi Arabia. So, 30 years prior to 1991, we'd already had the joy of having to deter conflict in the region. We've done it with naval power. The vessel deployed for it was HMS Bulwark, which was a commando carrier at the time. And she was had a full Royal Marine Commando unit aboard, I think. And she also had a... Uh, LST, the Army Operated Empire Gull, was also there with her. And HMS Strike, Striker, and a Royal Navy LST. So there were two LSTs, and what would we these days would be called an LPH. Significant force. And it was able to posture and do what it could. And this is the point about naval diplomacy. So often I see it as characterized into two things. The Terence meet and greet. The Terence meet and greet. And what you've hopefully got already from the discussions with me is that it's, on this channel, it's far more complicated than that. Naval diplomacy is far more nuanced and far more expansive than such by such a... Binary system would suggest. It's kind of interesting going through 
Gunboat Diplomacy by James Cable. Superpower and Maritime Strategy in the Pacific by... Edited by Frank C. Langdon and Douglas Ross. Or the other old standby... Incidents at Sea. By David F. Winkler. You start to realize, of these and for many other books, that actually naval diplomacy really does have a lot more texture to it. Almost more than land based diplomacy in a way, because land based diplomacy is so formalized and ritualized in so many ways. Whereas if you're just bumping into another ship at sea, there is precedent. But every scenario is unique. If you're in the middle of a raging storm, frankly, to going through the niceties of dressing ship and saying hello would probably seem rather pointless. If you're friends, you might say something. If you're enemies, you might just say, get out of my freaking way. You might not say anything at all. Anyway, we'll get into this. So much more than empires and gunboats. So, so much more. Um, and it does often get chucked to me that that is what naval diplomacy is, and it really isn't. So, it's naval diplomacy. And I know, there was a little bit of a break there, but um, I managed to drop a book. And I needed it, so I thought, rather than just having video of me scrambling across the bed, grabbing it and putting it back, I would pause and then forget it. So, all once. Build your pumps! Yay! There's a link down below to the latest one, which came out yesterday. Yes, there was Build pumps out yesterday. It comes out Wednesdays and Fridays. In the first three weeks, and after that, Wednesdays. I'm not sure how much catnip that poor cat has had, but it's way too much. Way, way too much. Oh, so. It's over yawn or laugh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but it's the cat. <laughs> oh. What is naval diplomacy? Well, here's an official definition taken from Karen Rowland's Naval Diplomacy in the 21st Century. A model for the post-Cold War global order. Please read nothing into the fact that of the books I've shown you, I haven't shown you his. Naval diplomacy is a subset of general diplomacy and means of communication by maritime actors, both state and non-state, in the pursuit of their interests. It's a narrative in this work which very much follows the idea that the Cold War's over, peace is broken out, and that's going to be the case at sea. The world of the strongly worded note. It was a nice time while it lasted. It was. But... For some, it never seemed to be enough, and it focuses primarily on those events which involve direct communication or interaction in its idea. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a part of naval diplomacy. But my definition, and the one I will certainly be working with, is slightly more expansive. Everything just shy of war that takes place in the maritime sphere. And I would also honestly argue that war is part of naval diplomacy, but I think I might get into trouble arguing that one. 
or rather, I might leave that for another day's argument. After all, war is the continuation of naval uh, diplomacy by another means. When words no longer work, we uh, continue. Uh, we carry on with steel and, well, these days, missiles, lasers, people tapping on keyboards. All part of it. But still, if you take war as being a continuation of diplomacy by another means, then you have to consider that every single interaction, every single movement is going to see its naval diplomacy. And there is a simple reason for this. The sea is an international sphere. No one controls it. You can go where you like, when you like, in reason of ten uh, nations, ten mile limits, and certain exclusive economic zones, in which spaces they do prefer you to um, at least be open about your presence. The trouble is, that then takes it to a very interesting point of view. Because, as the sea is an international space, everything that happens, therefore, as I said, is diplomacy, or naval diplomacy. So that means everything must be approached on the grounds of it being naval diplomacy. So I'm going to see the problem. If you think of things as being simple, one-dimensional, that's a war mission, that's a fisheries protection mission, that's a this, that's a that, it's very difficult to start going, well, actually, yes, that might be a fisheries protection mission, but it also means it has, uh, because it's staking a claim and managing an area, it's a diplomatic mission as well. It's, one of those it's showing your interest in this area. It's just a lot of fun and a lot of complexity which is a word I'm going to be using a lot today and it's not a word I really love to use a lot because I often think when people use it a lot it sounds like they're hiding something in this case it's not so much hiding something as I could make this a 40 minute presentation an introduction. I could make this a four and a half hour introduction. I could make this a 40 hour introduction. I could seriously design an entire course around naval diplomacy and its reality today quite easily. An entire module would be very, very easy to build around the subject. In fact, I'm surprised more universities don't teach modules on this one because it is so easy to build one something around. Because there is so much you can include on it. But there is a reason why you could do that, because there is so much. Explain in the summary. But there's also a reason why you can't. Or why it's difficult. And there is therefore a reason why I am sometimes going to say today things are complicated. Trust me. You really want to know more on it, I will explain more and give more examples than I give today. Well, no, than I give in the introduction, which is going to be the same day, as the live. I will give in a live this evening at 6. So here are some of the things that my definition opens up to. The Terence, both conventional and nuclear. Presence, both in terms of patrol and contact. Um, image projection. Image projection is a difficult one. Let's put it this way. With naval diplomacy, and I'll get into this as I go, the reason image projection comes in is you have to consider every contact to be first contact. Every meeting to be like an interview for a job you really want. You have to show up looking smart, confident, 
capable. But also preferably do that all in a non-threatening but still impressive way. Or sometimes you have to do all that in a threatening and still impressive way. And sometimes you have to do that in a reassuring and impressive way. I'm noticing a theme here. Now let's put there. It's not just turning up, it's how you turn up and how you look when you do. It matters. I love this t-shirt. It's very comfortable. And it fits with the channel. It fits that I wear wacky t-shirts. Because I'm doing this from home. And I'm talking to you, actually, from my bedroom slash office. So, I'm wearing this. But there are videos of me when I'm lecturing, and the ones at university, where I wear a suit, because that fits. Because in that scenario, that's what you need to be. Yeah. I'll explain more as we go. But direct communication is next. So, this comes from a, uh, a site where the link to which is down in the um, scroll down thing down below, the description down below. Uh, direct communication, port visits and conversations at sea. Well, conversations at sea are the more difficult ones to talk about, but they happen. Ships see each other, ships tell each other. The port visits is an interesting one. Look at that. Look at all the countries that are getting visited and who they're getting visited by. Who's got a mixture of red and blue? Who's got a mixture of yellow and blue? Who's got a mixture of... red and yellow? Who's got all three? Why do they have all three? Port visits are these huge occasions. They can be minor. We're just stopping in to an, ex to an ally, just filling up as I, on our way and going. They can be, we're stopping in and we're going to host a Navy Day. We're going to host a party. We're going to be open to have visitors. They can be, we're showing up in one ship. We're showing up in two ships, three ships, a whole fleet. And all these things have bearing about what message you want to say and what message you are uh, is heard. If you're trying to reassure an ally which has just been visited by a major fleet, let's say three or four top of the line looking escorts, and remember, they only have to look good. For the civilian mindset. You and I, in fact, most of people who've been channeled properly, are sufficiently interested in naval affairs, in ships, and what's going on to actually go, well, that's only got that gun, that's only got that missile system, so actually, it's not that great. But those sort of port visits aren't for people who are informed, people who are interested. Those in support visits are for impressing upon people who have other interests and who just see the front page of a newspaper or the flash five minutes on the evening news or some posts on social media. And then they look big, they look scary, they look powerful. So let's say an enemy nation has visited an ally nation with that. You decide to reassure them by sending a supply ship to visit. 
It's hardly going to be reassuring. Oh, yeah, don't worry. They sent four warships and a supply ship. We sent our oiler. The Tide class are cute, but it wouldn't really have the same bearing, would it? What's interesting is that's about roughly a 12-month period. And what I think it doesn't sort of feature is the fact that there's also British, French, you know, NATO port visits going on as well around there and all sorts of things. It's just the big free states, as we call them. What would we? You've got a definite superpower. And you've got two other nations which qualify as superpowers based on their nuclear arsenals. Or rather, one superpower with global reach, one superpower with supra-regional reach, and one superpower with hmm, regional plus reach. But perhaps that's all they need. That's a fun question. So there are conversations at sea and there are port visits. And the port visits can have a lot of levels beyond that which is the conversation. That which is the ministers you meet or the influential business people or the anything that Carrie Egger has carried out. And it all matters. What's also interesting is the way naval diplomacy and port visits can start to make it look like you have spheres of influence. If so you turn up well, I reckon. And it also depends on how well your diplomatic service functions in that area, how effective they're going to be. But port visits are, of course, the most obvious part of naval diplomacy, as are conversation at sea, task groups bumping into each other. How do they react? Do they go head to head? Do they go around each other? Do they talk? Do they maybe engage in a friendly exercise? Do, what do they do? How do they do it? This is all diplomacy, and this all has bearings. And it goes higher. And I know I just said bearings here, but bearings rather than bearing, but there's a reason for that. This all has bearing, it all has weight. This all has bearings, because they're all sitting on little tons and tons. It's like this thing is balanced on all these little bearing balls. You know, those little tiny balls you get. And they're all balanced. And every single one can spin independently. And if they all spin in different complexes, that's what you end up. And this is why naval diplomacy can go so right and go so wrong so quickly. Because it's all sorts of little balls. And you need to be, this is why you need to think about it. But also why you need to prepare for it. Straits of Hummers is a classic example where both port visits and conversations at sea happen on a regular basis. Mostly pretty much everyone with the Iranians going, what the are you doing now? Occasionally the Iranians with the Royal Navy going, what are you doing now? Because the Royal Navy's going, right then, we see you've built a new installation there. We're going to go take a look. Why? Because you've been annoying us for the last few weeks, so we're going to annoy you back. Now, here is something I want you to think about with port visits. 99% of the world's data traffic travels by undersea, tra undersea cables. 93 to 94% of the world's trade by volume. 90 to 91% of the world's trade by value travels by the sea. Look at which countries get visited more often than others.
Look at which countries don't get visited that often. Think about which countries haven't been visited, which should be visited. Nations might make statements about wanting to change the global system, and they probably do, but they want to benefit them. Also, nations the past. But one of the interesting things that stayed virtually the same is you can go back through periods and you can find that pretty much the same trade routes still. They might be different places, but they still matter. And the thing is, if they still matter, then the countries along those trade routes still matter. There is a South Africa visited Times. by all three the first thing is that in 12 months Egypt didn't get any official visits by anyone other than the Russians But you do have both the Russians and the Chinese have gone to visit Portugal. Australia. A point here. So the first any nation be maximizing and securing their access and movement at sea of their trade goods. Hence countries along the routes matter. So if the Suez Canal closes down, well, that's South Africa. Which is kind of sad for Hawaii. And you can sort of see it if you look at the global shipping routes map. You can work out where Hawaii is. Deterrence, nuclear, and conventional. So I'm going to start off with nuclear. Nuclear is very simple. Those people who try and pretend it's not are probably trying to make it over com overly complicated. Try and make a case either for more of it or less of it. You either have it or you don't. It's the thing. You either have it or you don't. If you don't have it, and another nation does have it, and they decide to boss you and your friends around, then your choice is ultimately, do you think they're bluffing about threatening to use it or not? If you think they're bluffing, then you can just ignore them. If you don't... It's mutually assured destruction. It is two gamblers sitting at a table playing poker with both of them having guns on the table. That's it. So, so the gun sitting there. 
You can both feel confident. You both have guns. Neither's going to cheat. Carry on. Either you reach to your gun, the other one will get to their gun just almost quick. So the odds are you might get a shot off first, but this one will get their shot off almost as quickly, and you'll both be dead. There is. That's it. That's what nuclear deterrence is. The one issue you have as a nation is what form of nuclear deterrent do you want? Where is it? That depends again on who do you think your nuclear threat is. Besides how, what size weaponry you need, whether you need an artillery shell, an aircraft, or a missile. And what type of missile? You then have to work out how big a nation am I, where can I hide the stuff. If I can't hide and secure it on land, do I want to keep it flying around above my head? Well, the lessons of the Cold War were that nuclear weapons flying around our heads sometimes came down with a big bump in contact with the earth or deep parts of water. Um, so probably not. Okay, what's the next option? Well, the next option is an at-sea nuclear deterrent. And here's the important thing. This is why I use the two gentlemen at the gambling table. Everyone has their gun already out. Everyone knows everyone has a gun. Let's say there's another player sitting there. Everyone's still playing. And they go to draw their gun. What does that do to the situation? Not gonna make it pretty, is it? You have two choices. Either you end up with an immediate standoff and everyone grabbing their guns and hope no one starts firing, and you have to talk down from a very high tension, or alternatively people start shooting. Either way, it's not good. So this is why you have the continuous at sea nuclear deterrent, because that gun on the table is a calming. We all have guns, let's none of us use them. Not having that gun on table and not having that gun at all, that's a fine thing as well, because that's the choice you've made. You basically said, I don't think you guys will shoot me. I don't need the gun. Many, many lessons of movies and what happens to gamblers around guns would suggest that's not the case, but we'll leave that to one side. It's a gamble. If you want to take it, you take it. But what you do not want to do is be the person who decides to pull the gun in the middle of the standoff. Because that's going to kick everything off. So you either have a continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent, if that's your policy, or you don't. In which case you either have four submarines or you have zilch, which do the role. You can either guarantee it at sea or you can't. Now... Conversely, conventional deterrence is all about not revealing the big gun. Okay, 4C failed. We know this over a long time. A, it arrived a few days. It sort of had literally been there just a couple of days before World War II really broke out. And B, it was deployed to the wrong place. Conventional tolerance works best when you can have a small force up forward as your visible presence. It's not threatening. It's not going to provoke anyone. It's not enough that they can justify you as a casa spell. I'll say you're creating force against us and you're massing and ready for war. But it's enough to go, look, we're a tripwire. You hit us. You hit them. You have to go through us. And that's going to set things off. The thing is, your carrier battle group your amphibious strike group, they're sitting further back. And this is really your problem when people start saying you can get by with smaller, lighter, quicker reaction forces. You can. Of course you can. As long as you're prepared to use them quickly. And I mean very quickly. Forces which work based on speed require speed of decision, 
So you have to have speed of intelligence to work out what's going on, speed of planning to develop and come up with options, and then speed of execution. And the decision has to be made by the politicians instantly. What a good example of where light forces were ultimately employed suicidally, slowly, Gallipoli. If those same forces had all been massed in one concentrated hit at the beginning, there had been no earlier attack, there had been nothing, and they'd just been used and gone through. They've been quick to say, we're going to do Gallipoli. <whistles> Done. We're going to do the Darnells. And everything being massed, everything put together, and then gone. There mean, no, it could have worked. Because the Turks wouldn't be prepared, and they would have had enough forces to quickly overwhelm what was available there and push through. They'd have still had to accept terrible casualties, though. That's the thing. And that was with a lot of more troops. If you want to forward base small groups of troops on a ship at sea, you know, around the world, that's fine. That's a good plan for having a rapid reaction force to local events. You have that force base nearby with the helicopters, etc. to support them. But you have to be quite careful when you actually use them. Using them as a deterrent is not really that viable. They are a deterrent in the broader sense of your, this capability exists, but they are more a nuclear style deterrent than a conventional deterrent. Because if you're actually using to deter, you're revealing they're there. Okay, we now know there's a company of Royal Marines nearby. Yes, they're very well armed. Yes, they're very well trained, but there's still only a company of them. Oh. And it's the same, actually, with the U.S. Marine Corps' new plan. Because whilst it's very good, and I do see a, see a scenario where, yeah, Mac, where you can have an LHD, LSD, that sort of combo sitting center, providing a sort of nexus point while smaller amphibs go out and drop off self-contained units and this is the big point that can bring home bring in the heavy stuff should it be needed the heavy uh, the heavy group if they're needed that's a great operational plan but for the deterrence the smaller number actually doesn't work because in the deterrence you have to do one of two things you either turn up with such a small force that it is Practically pitiful and practically suggesting you find their friends laughable, so this is all turn up, but it represents the far larger force you have back home and are able to deploy, or you turn up with overwhelming force. You don't really have much of a wager in, in between. In between causes trouble, in between gets you into trouble, in between is where problems lie. So, yes, the small vice fort is a good thing, it raises the level of the bar on which it sort of practically it becomes what it, let's put it away. it raises the cost bar of doing anything it raises the amount of forces you need to be able to do any operation but it doesn't raise it by that much it perhaps raises it by enough but not by that much the thing is, what really raised that bar is that little force then, if anything happens to them, knowledge that there is a far bigger force that can be mobilized and will come for you. Now, does that force need to be massive? One well, nicest way Britain's not a superpower. We are allied with one, but we're not a superpower. In America's case, they have to deal with a peer threat, which can be China or Russia. For the rest of us, most likely, if we end up in a war with Russia or China, or America, hope not, um, you'd hope you'd be part of an alliance. But still, for a, ma uh, for a major, for, or for even for Britain, you need to have some sort of formation which is capable of responding. You need to have a carrier battle group. You need to have an amphibious task group. Preferably that can land 
And it might be, you know, I have already put up a thing of being reserve as an idea for some of the big ships, etc., to be maintained in reserve. With reserve, with core crews and reservists to activate them when they're needed. I'm not talking about permanently operating them, I'm talking about activating them when they're needed to maintain some sort of brigade capability. Because that is the sort of size force which you probably need in the British case at the maximum. But deterrence is a lot, very much about presence and reach. Okay? It's about presence and reach. <sighs> so, contact. Who do you train with? What missions do you train for? And who do you invite to dinner? And how many and where are they hosted? These things matter. Do you put everyone in the hangar? Do you invite them to the ward room for drinks? What part of the ships do they get to see? These things all have a value, all have a matter in terms of presence. And it helps to have a range of dining venues in mind when you're designing your ship. Which can sound very strange when you're designing a warship to, to go range of dining menus, uh, venues, but actually this matters. Because if you want to impress a senior minister, etc., you don't really want to sit them in a hangar unless you're inviting them and several hundred of their pals. Um, then that's sort of going to impress them because there's a nice big space you can stick them in. And you put the helicopter out on the flight deck and you ha can have some beautiful music being played. And you can do it all sort of beautifully. Ideally, though, if you're doing an instrument dinner, you, you need the wardroom space. You need some sort of space you can entertain them. Maybe even a captain's table or a more select gathering, an ambassador, a couple of ministers from the government. And these things to make points quietly. Okay? Who do you train with? What missions do you train for? Do you just train with the Navy on a regular basis, or do you train with their Coast Guard and their police as well? Who are you making friends with? This all matters. What missions are you training for them? Are you training for counterterrorism and counter drugs? Are you training with them for war fighting? Are you stressing to them that Britain could be a useful ally in more than just one area of issues? Are you being America teaching them tactics which suit their capabilities and their abilities and their threats? Or are you trying to teach them stuff which suits your style of warfighting? Which they might aspire to but not be able to get to. If you're Russia and China, what are you getting out of this? What are you training them for? What do you need them for? You have to think about all of this. And I know I'm probably speaking a little bit on the quiet side sometimes, but sometimes I'm speaking quietly because I'm trying to make the point. Now, a visiting a region is a demonstration of reach. That's lovely. There's recently been a whole question about uh, aircraft carriers and Britain's presence in the Far East. And here's my view. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a Type 23, eventually a Type 31, forward based in Singapore. Much like we have HMS Montrose in Bahrain. I just wouldn't be surprised about it. I think you'd have a carrier battle group visiting there every few years. Now, the Bonham Richard might change, uh, scenario might change that if the Americans make a request. And are prepared probably to stump up some cash, let's be honest. But that is the scenarios you're dealing with. The carrier group turning up is is showing reach. It's showing Rin's ability to operate in that region. It's a demonstration of power. But it's not necessarily a demonstration of presence. By that I mean presence is years of being there. The forward basing of Montrose in the Gulf is Britain saying, we're here. How many other powers are here? 
it actually almost gives us more of a diplomatic presence in the region than the Chinese. <coughs> because in the nicest way, we have power, we have presence. All the time. They don't. Their yeah, governor will probably work on it. So you have to think what am I doing with this deployment? Presence shows interest. Interest means you're at the table. And remember, the t for nations, the important thing is to be at the table for decisions to be made. Because that's where you can best defend your people's interests. And that's where you've got to get secure. Base point, government has to look after the interests of its people. That's how it stays in power. You get that table, space at the table, you get that vote by highlighting your interest and by having presence in a region. You want to be involved in decisions made in that region. You want to have a say in what's going on. You want to be a relevant player on the global stage. You've got to be there. You've got to show up. And when you show up, you have to bring something which is valuable to the table. But there is a different. You don't necessarily have to be there the whole time with what is valuable. Your presence vessels can be like cruisers. They can be in 1920s, or they can be a Type 31 frigate. What you bring to the table in a conflict is a carrier battle group, an amphibious task group. But what you have presence in the region, making your friends, making it known, showing that you would shop if you felt your interests required it, can be lesser. It can be more suited to the task it's going to be facing out there, which is patrol, presence, dealing with scenarios which may turn from minor to hot very quickly. It's a difference. It's a different requirement. Image. No matter how many times I say this, I keep having to say it, and I will say it many, many more times for in my life. I don't give a flying hoot how good your ship is built for war. I don't care how good its crew will perform in war. They are probably are going to be excellent, and in wartime, that's useful. That is what I will care about. But in peacetime, in naval diplomacy terms, that doesn't matter half as much as if that ship is painted a nice uniform colour, preferably white, but grey will do. It's a bit boring, but, you know, that's fine. I understand that's the warry colour we go with these days. And actually looks in decent nick. And all the components are working. And I don't want this to offend anyone, because I see ships, especially American ones recently, working so darn hard. But it's first impressions. It goes back to that interview scenario. You do not turn, no matter how hard, if you, even if you're the hardest working mechanic, and you turn up to an interview, and you're over, and you're wearing overalls. They're all scruffy. You look like you haven't showered in a month. You smell of I don't know what. The impression of you versus a possibly a slightly less good mechanic, but who turns up sh suited, booted with a shirt and tie on, looking like they've showered, slept, and you know how to use a razor. Says this on a day which he doesn't shave. Um, the other person, the less good mechanic, is probably going to get that job. Because first impressions matter. Well, it's the same with naval diplomacy. It's the same when, if you're, if an enemy nation sends a major task group to a, to a port visit of an ally and is all big and intimidating, you don't want to turn up in a supply ship. 
That's bad that they brought a supply ship as well. They brought four warships. They look good. You need to turn up in something which looks better. You need to turn up in something... Where you don't need to turn up in the task group. You don't need a full turn to start matching them ship for ship. If you're having to do that, then you're kind of admitting their ships are good. But if you can turn up in one ship, and you can make sure you have that ship available to turn up in. And it looks really, really good against them. That is what you need to do. You need to make sure that they, they spent days saying to everyone how good looking their ships are and how much that how powerful they are because they look good and then you need to make sure you turn up just as it's almost reaching the peak and your ship looks better see if it wasn't for the railgun sonata saga with the zumwalts if instead of the railgun sonata saga They'd actually gone with the advanced gun system primarily and then work, decided they were going to work on the rail guns and fit them later to them. The Zumwalts would be an absolutely perfect system for the Americans to do this with. And there's a reason for that. Yes, the Chinese ships and the Russian ships, especially ones I'm building now, do look of their time. They look very modern. Zoom up with its tumble down hull, it's all its shaping, it looks next generation. It doesn't look modern, it looks beyond modern. Now, I can point out though, there is one lucky thing. As I said earlier, the audience of these things is not necessarily the people. Who will know all about the railgun advanced gu advanced gun system saga of the Zumwalts? So, them turning up will probably still have the same impact. But this is a problem when you're looking at ship design, when you're looking at the world in terms of maintenance, when you're looking at ship numbers. Maintenance matters. Having time to form proper maintenance, having enough crew that you can properly rest your crew, that you can send officers off for research assignments to study things, that you can send officers off to do career progression, all these things matter. We keep building warships and we're just going, this is how many we need for battle groups in wartime. That is a lovely figure, that is a figure which is critical, but I also want to be put next to that figure, how many ships do we need to fight peace? Or to wage peace? Because naval diplomacy doesn't stop. Naval diplomacy is not like a war, it doesn't happen and then stop. It keeps going, it's constant. It's ongoing, it's normal, it's like every day of the it's every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year, naval diplomacy is going on. We have to start functioning this into our design strategies, into our fleet and force numbers. The presence mission matters, the naval diplomacy mission matters. It used to be something which was taken as very good. In the 1930s, when the Royal Navy was saying, we need 70 cruisers, that wasn't just based on war numbers, that was based on peacetime requirements. And then the Cold War happened, and everything became about fighting a war. And you can understand that. But the trouble is, the Cold War never went hot. So we've spent years getting, generations getting into a cycle of just thinking about fighting a war, which never happened. And while we were doing that, well, waging peace got left behind. And now we've got to rediscover this, because in the world we're in now, naval diplomacy is going to be very big. Seven tenths of the world's surface, and a lot more than that, is impacted by naval diplomacy directly. The whole of the world is based off it. 
There is a problem though, and there is this reason why naval diplomacy is not as easy to teach, why it's difficult. We have built a world which is based around quantitative data. It is. Look at it. Mass data analysis. Uh, all this quantity, all these figures, all these numbers being applied to things and values and uh, logarithms and everything being put together to work it out. And if I hear the phrase defense my matrix twice a day, I consider that an honor. That consider a light day. Usually I have defense by matrix thrown at me four or five times in a single phone call. There's all sorts of ideas. Oh, it's all this, this, this. And the trouble is with diplomacy, with most of human interactions, it's not quantitative, it's qualitative. And it's subjective qualitative as well. You, uh, it's very difficult to argue uh, that war that could have happened didn't happen because we had good relations with these people thanks to our ongoing presence. The war never happened. The war was never likely to happen if it will probably never even felt, appeared on any ones because you had good relations, because you had presence. I can point to the times when it goes wrong. That's easy enough, but that's very, very easy to say then, oh, this system doesn't work because it went wrong on X, Y, and Z. Because we don't know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. Because they never happened. Because they don't. So we don't know about them. We can't point to them. There are a couple we can. You know, Guatemala, Belize. We can point to issues over the Falklands. We can point to issues, all sorts of incidents listed in gunboat diplomacy, in incidents at sea. We can point to all those. But there's a limit, a very big limit. In that we can only point to these because these got to the extreme even of naval diplomacy. They didn't hurt hot, but they were close, and so they were studied and talked about. But still, the vast majority are things which never happen because they got snuffed out before they even began. And that's harder to prove. I know it happened. I know it's the case. But you can't prove it. You can know something, but you can't prove it. And that's why it's subjective, qualitative data. It's about instinct. And it's about reading the lines of the history and reading it forward. This is going to be a lot longer than 35 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> so, I hope you have enjoyed this. Um, I'm going to actually... I'm going to make this go out at midnight because it's a long one and I realize a long one is going to be more difficult for people to watch. So I'm going to try and put this, load this up and make it come out at midnight. Tonight, at midnight. So you'll hopefully have had 18 hours to look at it. Right then, here are what we've got. Thursday, 6th of July, that's today. We have Naval Diplomacy. Monday, 20th of July, we have the Patreon video. Thursday, 23rd of July, we have From the Sea. Tuesday, 20th of July, we have Making Mari Nostrum a Hollow Jest. And Thursday, 3rd of July, we have Pre-Tribals. Monday in the third, um, we have patron video, uh, The Little Boat Wars, courtesy of Tony Penfold. This is in August. Then we have 6th of August, we have The Outcome of the Spanish Armada. 
11th of August, the Battle of Cape Passaro. How many of you heard of the Battle of Cape Passaro before you this video? And the 13th, HMS Emerald and Enterprise, the E-Class Cruisers, on the first steps of Modern Force. I sometimes wonder if actually we should consider them two different classes, but no, they're the only E-1s available. And HMS Enterprise is a long-running name in the Royal Navy, and actually is one of the best Twitter ships to follow. If you don't follow HMS Enterprise on Twitter, you are missing out on some brilliant tweets. And then we have Daniel Freeman's, uh, what if the Singtao incident goes hot? <laughs> well, that's a become a rather interesting one. And there's, I'm following all sorts of lines. The idea is possibly now that actually, well, the thing is, Japan was pretty much a bit of a national para international para in 1939. Um, I have a little bit of a scenario, which I'm, one of the scenarios I'm considering and working through is that not only do you have Britain, France, and America end up fighting Japan, but actually Russia's at war with them already, so the Soviet Union allies with that group and goes in for the kill. Enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing going on there. And interesting enough, what did Italy and Germany do? Because if you've got America... Britain and France are all going to war against someone who has violated the na international norms and international treaties. And you have two grandstanding, pompous gamblers who are running countries, who have both invested in, na in pride of place naval ships. I have the sneaking suspicion you would end up with Italian and German heavy units going out to join the Allied war against Japan. I just have the sneaking society. And it becomes a really weird thing because at a certain point it's a case of they're a gambler and frankly let's be honest one of them is a SHIT completely completely and the other one is uh, TWAT. Um, leaving that to one side, though, it's a start. Uh, once I, I it's, once I got into this scenario and started following, some very interesting ideas come up of what ends up happening. It's quite scary, but it's a very interesting idea of what ends up happening, especially if there ends up being a ground war in Japan. Anyway, the Battle of Texiel um, is 20th of August. 25th of August, could Crete have been saved in 1941? I'm getting into a few of these what-if questions. I quite enjoy them. 27th, um, the Convoy War and the Perfect Storm of PQ-17. And Patron 5, Metrain gunboat was for Lomacy and in the Victorian era. Constantinople and Alexandria. That's, of course, when naval diplomacy involved turning up with gunboats and going, well, do what we say. No, fine. Boom, boom, boom. Do what we say. Yes, okay. It was a simple time. But the thing is, actually, a lot of other techniques had been tried before the fleets were sent in. The fleets were the last resort. There was a lot. Those were both long-running sagas long before the fleets went in. And where else can you find me? Well, there's Twitter, AC underscore Naval History. There's Patron. Thank you very much to all my patrons. They are really they're keeping me in books. As universities, etc. cut hours for early career researchers and other companies I work for aren't doing their summer schools. I don't know. It's one of the more interesting modern things. You think you're being quite smart as a young researcher who's still got to build up their academic profile to get a permanent job, really. Um, especially in their design institutions. You think you're being kind of smart having a multi-stream 
income base. You know, more than one employer, in fact. Technically seven. Until a scenario like this comes along and actually clamps them all down. The whole point of having that many was that if you know one went down, you had multiple others to keep you going, and it just didn't matter. But I don't know. Ah, and global maritime history, which is a lot of fun, and we'll be getting some papers soon. So that is Dr. Alex Clark does naval history live. And that was the introduction to Naval Tunnel Diplomacy. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. And I hope to see you this afternoon for the live and the full-length discussion. Anyway, thank you. Take care. And see you later. <laughs>